Hi, my name is Eric Dewar. I'm Associate Professor of Biology at Suffolk University in Boston, and there I teach a course about evolution for students who don't major in science called Humans and the Evolutionary Perspective. And I'm here today with a couple of my honor students, and we're going to talk about a short article that we read. So uh, why don't you guys introduce yourselves? Um, I am Miguel. I'm a law mayor, and I love science as a hobby. I'm Patrick, and I'm also a law major. All right, lawyers. Should have made you guys read the crime <laughs> stuff I had the last group read. So this article is basically like, are our cell phones making us dumb? Or are they going to kill us? Or are they going to prevent us from being able to be effective at work or be able to be like emotionally mature? Does this sound like every kind of like scold you've heard from everybody older than you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, one of the things is funny because in my English class when I was in high school in sophomore year, we had to read an, uh, an article. And the whole idea was that, and I noticed it at home, is that we always um, criticize the young people from being on their phones all the time. But uh, it's also been shown that people in their 40s and 50s are also hooked up to their technologies a lot almost to the same level as, uh, as young people. Yeah, there's definitely a kids today thing that has always been true. It was true when I was your age. It was true when I was a child. Back when I had my, my Atari at home and my, you know, my yeah. parents thought that I was on, on that too much. Yeah, if I could walk around with my Atari in my pocket, it'd be a whole different deal. What's it going to be when your kids you know, have, you know, have like jackets that, are, that have the devices implanted in them already? you know, or smart devices surrounding them at all times. Um, or even the ability to have a private conversation, you know? If you, like, I don't have a Siri, I mean, I, I, mean, I don't have a, an Alexa at home or anything, but, you know, the only way that I know my phone isn't listening is if I like, leave it in the car and walk away from it. You know? <laughs> Pat, what do you think about this? Yeah, I, um, I thought it was interesting how, uh, um, I think the very beginning, um, when, uh, when she talked about, uh, how important it is um, to, um, I, I think she was saying like kind of like daydream sort of, just um, how important it is for your memory. I hadn't even really thought of it that way. Um, I know people say, like the one of the most common things uh, that people criticize about uh, the, I guess you could say an excessive use of technology is the fact that um, it makes people less social and it's almost used as sort of uh, a substitute for actually talking to people. And, um, I think there's been a lot of studies that have shown that, but I, I just thought it was interesting. I hadn't really thought of it that way. I hadn't really um, even considered it that um, how important it is for, for brain development just to uh, daydream. Um, and I think, um, I don't know, because it just, daydreaming just comes across as something so insignificant. So I hadn't really thought that it, it could make, it could be that important, I guess. Mm. You know, um, yeah, your brain has, it was psychologists identified years ago that their, their brain just has like two modes. There's like the system, what they call system one, which is sort of your default mode, which is like the daydreaming mode where you're just sort of, um, there's this uh, stream of ideas that come through your consciousness that you can, you know, you, know, you, can, you can notice or you can ignore. It's where like inspiration tends to happen, but it's different from like this, this um, system two which works in opposition, which is for doing like focused work. So if you're trying to focus on a single task, that gets tiring after a while, not because you lose concentration. Well, I suppose you lose concentration because of the fatigue of your brain. Basically there are like legit um, chemical molecules that carry oxygen, that carry energy that are getting used up in the cells that are doing this. So you need to sort of let it take a break and then sort of go out to the default mode. Or it's like you're trying to remember something and then it doesn't pop into your head until you're doing something unrelated. You know, there's a lot to be said for, you know, and even, you know, Darwin used to go for a walk every day just to sort of clear his head, just sort of, like Thoreau was the king of this. Like, every, like many, many writers, creative people, scientists um, have all, basically, they talk a lot about this time just to walk and just to not have, you know, not have any information coming in. The ability to sort of yeah, be by yourself is a skill that takes time. And this sort of, you know, when it's a, it's almost a crutch in a way, at least it's, it seems with the way, with the, where creative ideas come from, it's almost like a crutch sometimes if you are constantly having in, input happening. 
you know, because yeah, you can be distracted, but you, you can't, it's difficult to deal with something at a deeper level if it's just a wash of information that's coming toward you. Well, it's also like, um, which uh, I've noticed that the greatest scientists are very good at giving anecdotes to explain everything. Like when Einstein was explaining relativity, it's like think of two trains coming on way when um, the, um, I forgot his name, but the, there was the guy who named the clouds all he used to do as a kid was literally daydreaming, looking at the clouds. And that's how they, he noticed that they had different shapes, something that even I'm looking at them and it's hard for me. So it's, it's that like, yeah, you should be factually based, you know, research, do evidence. But the, the greatest scientist always knows how to give a story, which means that they looked at the things that are like stray and, and cold facts. They look at it also in kind of like a, like a sensible way, like, oh, let's explain this to people. I really enjoy what I'm doing. Yeah, I like that in a sensory way, because you know, the idea, the ability to describe complicated things in metaphors helps things to get chunked up so that other people can get their arms around them. You know, and I think that's, yeah, that's one of the things that's like needed. Like when you were learning how to read, um, you like, you learned your letters first and then, you know, and you learned to kind of spell out words. But after a while, like, you know, once you're over about seven, you don't like sound out words anymore. You sort of chunk them all up together. You recognize them as blocks. And so um, I think that's something that we get, you know, the more familiar you are with that, with a set of ideas, the easier it is to chunk up. And, but for someone who's new to a set of ideas, like what the shapes of the clouds are, or what relativity is, um, having analogies or having metaphors to be able to explain what they're like helps to give somebody the gist of what you're talking about. You know, what else do you think about that, Pat? Or about anything else? I think um, there's, I, I think we might have a problem um, that goes even beyond this. I think maybe just in this part of the world, like, you know, I know a lot of people, um, and maybe Miguel can attest to this uh, coming from the DR, but I know a lot of people from different countries that, you know, their way of life is so different from here. They have, um, they come here and it's like, wow, like you guys never take a break. So I don't even know if it's just the technology as much as it is, and maybe the technology contributes to it a lot. But I think that maybe just in general, even even before all this technology, going back like 50 years, I think it's just been something, it's just kind of been like the American way. Like we, if, if, if you're taking a break, it's kind of looked down upon. It's like you could, be, you could be doing other things, but I think we really need to look at it more as, in a lot of situations, you become a lot more productive, uh, not only for yourself, but maybe for other people by just doing nothing. And I, I, I think, I think people think like, Oh, it's like you sleep like eight hours a day and you work like, I don't know, 16 hours a day and that's enough, but it's really not. Though. I mean, as this article says, there's, there's so much more to, to brain development than just sleep. So. Yeah. There's nothing. Oh, all right. Yeah, Americans have really fetishized the idea of busyness. You know, you, you, when you go to yeah. when you go to law school, this is the thing. Is, oh man, I'm so busy. You know, I got all this stuff going on, and it's sort of. And you probably see this now. Your friends will show off like, oh man, I've got 18 papers and 15 exams, and then I have to do a mock interview, and then I have to, you know, hike the Appalachian Trail, and then you know, so it, everything's like they got you know, because that's. I think some of that expresses the frustration that we have, the, you know, um, Im imposter syndrome that some people struggle with, you know, all those sorts of things. Basically say, well, no, no, I'm, no, I'm busy. I know what I'm doing. It makes it look like you have a plan and then it looks like you, um, you know what's up. But because uh, none, of, none of us want to look like we don't know what we're doing. And so I think some of it stems from that. So it's like these, it's a social game that we've all ag apparently agreed we have to play. Um, but uh, I remember my, uh, my wife telling me about a, a, a talk she went to one time by a scientist saying, well, how, you know, how much do you actually, um, you know, work, how much do you actually work on science in a given day? He's like, well, you know, I probably work on science about 12 hours a day because, you know, like I'll think about science when I'm walking to work or I'll think about science during lunch or I'll think about science when I'm getting a massage. You know, it's like it's all this sort of, you know, I guess that counts. But the, um, you know, but I think that, yeah, this peacocking that people do like look how busy I am that's something that I want uh, I'd like all my students to get sensitive to like that's what they're hearing it's not that boy I'm so busy but you're not so there's something wrong with the way that you're doing it I want people to like let that crap go you know but 
But yeah, because it's, it's also true, the, just the, the ability to sort of, I mean, observing the siesta, the ability to just sort of, you know, take a, take a break in the middle of the day and sort of walk around just to sort of, you know, you know, shake out the cobwebs a little bit, that does something for your brain. You know, and actually, I mean, it's um, resistance exercise, like weight bearing exercise in particular, but, um, you know, we're understanding more and more about how the hormones that are released when you exercise actually contribute to maintaining the brain, like into late adulthood. You know, so people who not just, you know, you're not saying you have to go and you know, everybody's got a bench 300 or something, but like people who actually do like regular exercise do tend to have like better brain health later in life. Like kind of if we're, if we're comparing, you know, if we're yeah. using rather the right comparative groups. Do you think that how many, um, so I assume you guys are like on Instagram? Yeah. No. No? Uh, I, I is Facebook totally like where your parents are now? <laughs> yeah the um but like for when you think of like how many connections you have on social media how does that number compare with the number of like irl friends you have like in the meat space um well for me it's funny because uh i have like around five thousand followers and the only ones i really talk to are the ones from like my childhood so I can tell you that in real life friends, I'll have like about 20 I talked to from from my childhood and, and I have 5,000. So, you know, out of the 20 I talked to, there's another 4,000 that I just have no idea. You know, some of our family, some of their like, but I really don't talk to them as much. They're just there. It's yeah, so like, why, the, the, like why keep them then? I don't know. See, and it's funny because I actually can, um, uh, the, that when you were talking about the social game, there is a social game in Instagram and Snapchat. And it's funny because one of my friends is, um, she's trying like to, we're talking about dating and stuff. And I said, Oh, let me look at your Instagram. And then he told me, he's like, see the relationship between the people you're following and the, and the people who you follow, it's too big. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, yeah, you don't match in the hierarchy. That, because I think like it was two to one, like I followed two people, but only one followed me back. And he's like, yeah, that's, that, that doesn't work right there. That's just, yeah, you, you don't have enough clout there if you have yeah. more, you're following more people than you follow. Yeah. yeah. I'll go through specifically to make sure I can uh, call some of those every now and then. But um, no, I, that's like I looked up before doing this, I was thinking about the, you know, number of social connections you have on social media. And I look at, I looked up um, Joe Exotic's Instagram. <laughs> and so he follows like five people, but he's got like millions of followers, you know, so that's a really great clout ratio, you know, but yeah. <laughs> I think it, now it, it comes down more and more to numbers. And, and uh, like you say, I feel like most, most of the followers that people have, or most most of the uh, people that people are following, they haven't talked to in several years, or they don't even. They might know them like oh, like a friend of a friend, but they don't actually talk to them. I feel like I feel like more and more it's coming down to, to numbers that it actually that it is like actual like concrete conversations. Yeah. Sorry, I got someone yeah. comment here from the peanut gallery. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's also the um the one of the articles talks about we like being on texting email because we like to be ready. That's what they say. You know what I mean? Like like when you're talking in real time and somebody says something, you have to give it on real time. You can't think. You can't think about the optics or how it's gonna look like. You have to respond. So it's like your it's that's our authenticity. But in an email, you can think like, okay, what's the best way I can say it? So I sound good, I look good, and I'm trying, to, and I'm saying what I want to say. So that's one of the reasons. So it's kind of like, um, it's uh, it's one of the reasons why you notice the uh, well, part of our generation and the new generation, they're so anxious about risk. You know what I mean? They they think too much and they don't try as much to take risk. They do take risks, but it's like now because of that idea, they think, you know, they want to prepare for everything, but they don't like, they say we're not, we're not thinking about, okay, there are some things that are going to happen that are outside your control, 
you just have to, you know, keep a cool head and try to make as much as you can. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Pat, what do you think about that? Yeah, I just, I, I think those are all interesting points. I think, um, I don't know. I, I just, thinking about this in terms of evolution, I just wonder, I wonder what this does for evolution, you know, because um, there was, um, in the second article that, that we looked at, um, the talk about um, so something that I've been thinking about for a long time, like, it has evolution stopped because um, cause, cause we're living more in a sophisticated, urban, uh, modern, whatever word you want to use, life? Has it stopped at all or, or not? And, um, and what I really talked about, uh, I thought was interesting, is that it couldn't have stopped. Like, evolution means that you're adapting to your environment over time. If your environment's changing, then by definition, uh, things are going to change. But I just wonder at, one, at what point, like, evolution usually takes time to change and i feel like because the technology is moving so fast i just i just wonder how how quickly how rapidly it, it, it could change and what effect that might have because um going back for our entire species uh human beings have been very social uh living things as have all all mammals but when you look at it now the technology is changing so fast that even with this article talking about how evolution is keeping up with it. I just wonder because the technology is moving at a rapid rate. Like for the last, for this century, it's been moving at a rapid rate, but now for like the past couple of years, it's becoming even more rapid. I just wonder at what point is the technology moving faster than the evolution in terms of you know, the things that we're talking about right here. Yeah. Oh, really cultural, what you're saying is absolutely right. Cultural evolution always outstrips somatic body evolution, right? Because cultural evolution, uh, somatic evolution is, you know, it runs on a clock of like generational time um, where we can see, so, but the but cultural evolution changes, like there's not even a regular clock to it. It's gonna depend on what kind of interaction we're talking about. Well, hell, I think we're, we're like, what, like 600 generations out from the inception of agriculture. I mean, that's not a lot of time in order for like, so people lived in cities for many, many generations, but not thousands of generations, you know, not millions of them. Um, so, but I, but, but I think that, yeah, cultural evolution has always outstripped our, like the body's ability to like respond to it directly. Um, you know, and also this has to do, this is now relating to back to the social media and the way that we interact with people like our expectation, like what it represents to us, we are so, because we're so social, our sensory, our, our brain is really sensitive to lots of social cues when we have face-to-face -face interactions with people. Um, but when you post something on the gram or you post something on Snapchat, it's gonna, you know, you're giving only the, the faintest like simulacrum of what you're seeing, you know? How many people, I do have one friend on Instagram who tends to post a lot of pictures of herself crying. <laughs> let's see how my kids laughing at that. Um, but we can you know, see um, through the mirror. The yeah, back. you can see in the mirror. Yeah, wave in the mirror. <laughs> but the um, what happens is yes, but like very few. Most people, it's like everybody's living their best life, you know. So if you have, yeah. so, but the thing is like, or like, how do you? First of all, I was married before like um, <laughs> internet dating got big. Um, so, but like the way that people, you know, before you decide which, sec which, which direction you're going to swipe, like how much information do you actually have about this person? Like, a really thin surface amount, you know, compared to what it would be like, even if you like pass them in the hallway, you know? So I think that um, there's, you know, that's one of the things that, I know people have written a lot of, there's been a lot of ink spilled about what social media like does to your brain. And it does habituate it to fast blips of information. It does habituate it to not wanting to be bored. But, <clears throat> but I think particularly in how we decide who we're going to pair bond with, there are a lot of the, we just get, um, you know, it's like almost, it's not even like the same, it's not in the same universe almost. We're not, it's just such a low bandwidth kind of information that comes through. But isn't it, it's, it's it ironically the the that se uh, sexual re reproduction uh, evolution? It's um it's kind of like Tinder, you know what I mean? Like a lion looks at another, looks at the female lion. And it's like okay, she looks good, right? You know what I mean? Like 
Like humans are like we as humans look to more than just how they look. You know what I mean? Like, oh, do they look strong? Can they, you know, like, can women bear children? You know what I mean? We don't do those basic things. But what? ironically... Of course you, uh, wait a minute, of course you do, you know? No, I mean, like, like we do, but it's not like, <laughs> you know healthy. what I mean? We don't look at, yeah, we don't teeth. look at, <laughs> we don't look at, like, we don't look at a woman as, like, that fit, you know what I mean? Because animals do, you know what I mean? Like, like, like a female, like a peacock will look at an owl, it's like, okay, this is the strongest guy, he hasn't died, he's a good choice. You know what I mean? We don't make those decisions. But at the same time, Tinder is kind of like if we were. Because like you said, it, it is true. You can write a thing in your bio, but nobody reads that. You know what <laughs> I mean? So it's like, no, it's honestly, you look at the picture, you make an assumption, and then you decide. You know what I mean? Kind of like what animals do. You know what I mean? They don't, they don't hang out for like three days, and then, you know, they make a decision. They just look at a line. They're like, okay, it, it, it's good to me. You know, it works. And then they go. Yeah. Different kinds of soul. <laughs> I saw a meme. One, <laughs> I, saw, I saw a GIF online one time that was when you put Cupid on full auto. And it's this woman who's there on her phone just going. <laughs> just, for, <laughs> just, just for all of them. It's like, oh, one of them's going to be a hit. <laughs> so, yay, that's horrifying. No, but I think this is one of the things we need to be mindful of when we're thinking about like interconnected devices that allow us to like to represent ourselves to other people sort of just for consumers to be aware that they're like, just like we always want to show like our best selves online, everybody else is doing that too. So it's more like this, it's more like the cult of busyness, I think, where you basically say like, look how, look how awesome everything is. So, you know, my whole life should be great. And then, but on the other hand, if you think, if you're going through hard times and you, you're faced with, um, you know, everybody else's profiles where, where life is great, you think, well, geez, my life sucks by comparison to this, you know, that's, a, that's hard on, it's hard on children. It's hard on lots of people. So, um, but that's another thing that we not, not everybody, like people talk about, but it's hard to take it. It's hard to convince your brain to take it to heart, you know? Um, yeah. What else do you want to make sure we talk about before we close today? If there was like one piece of advice you wanted people to have about thinking about, you know, about whether it's about the social aspect of our lives or about whether we're still evolving or anything, what would you want somebody to know? Uh, I think just that we are still evolving. Um, like I was saying earlier, um, you know, people think like, oh, are we becoming like too modern, too smart? Is the medicine, is the technology going too far that, evolution is just going to stop. Like, are we too perfect? Basically, I think people are thinking, but I think when you look at things, if science is never, I'm trying to think of how to word this. Like if science is never perfect, like we never, we've never had all the answers. We're always asking new questions. We've never learned everything. That means we're always making advances. So if we're always making advances, our lives are always changing. Then I think even just common sense, um, and the evidence clearly shows that that evolution will continue. I mean, it's, it's going to be obviously different than it has been for most of our existence. But um, I, I think when you just look at those two things, I think it's pretty clear that evolution is, is, is still a thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're recording this on April 17th, 2020. You know, we've all been home for a month. You know, this is, you know, what was normal before this is, you know, and we don't know where it's going to be coming up, where we're, where we're, what society's going to be like coming out of this. So, you know, there's going to be, there's always a new normal, you know, and this also presumes that we are living in the same current standard of comfort that we have today, which isn't always going to be the case. So, yeah, no, like, you know, we evolve, you know, things evolve when, um, when the environment changes and humans have been really good over the last, say, 100 years of helping to stabilize our environment. So evolution, our, our, our bodies change to that, to that environment really slows down because why F with success, you know? But um, yeah, no, all it takes is for the environment to change. All it takes is for, you know, you know, like there was a, it takes for the, when the environment changes, our bodies will respond to that. I think like not our bodies, but what's selected for in subsequent generations, you know, that's what's going to end up being selected for. Miguel, what do you, what would you want people to take away from this? Um, what I think the, the biggest takeaway will be um, that uh, uh, number one, evolution won't be uh, macro for a long time like we're, we're not gonna see like the way we look changing a lot 
even like many, as you said, because we, number one, we changed the environment. And number two, we're pretty, um, I would say like stable in the way we look, you know, we may have micro, small differences, but we're not gonna. And I think that the biggest, the second biggest one is that the evolution is mainly gonna be based on gastronomy. You know what I mean? Like the lactose intolerance, you know, um, geography uh, we've seen, you know, that some people are. As we globalize and people start traveling everywhere, we're going to start getting to a point where um, I wouldn't say all of us are uniformly uh, adapted to any type of food. We're going to see that we're more uh, persistent and we can tolerate almost all food coming from anywhere. I think that will be the, the biggest where I think that I think that will be where we, when we notice the change, the, the change, in, like where we really notice an evolutionary change. It's still going to happen because, you know, you can't stop it. But I think that's where people are going to notice it. Hmm. Yeah. So you think you seem to think that like gene flow is going to be the answer. Yeah. You know, like when we kind of yeah. really homogenize, because we you know today we can still recognize different um, source population groups, you know, that represent, um, you know, that initial emigration from Africa. But we also know today that most genetic diversity in terms of like heterozygosity is still in sub-Saharan Africa. So, yeah, but once we become truly cosmopolitan and anybody can like meet with people and fall in love and have kids with from anywhere else, you know, as that's happening, as if that happens more and more, then we're gonna see more and more gene flow, you know? But, you know, if it means, I don't, I don't know how long it would take for, you know, these, you know, if lactose persist, lactase persistence is a beneficial trait, I don't know how long that would take to permeate because it's been going for, you know, what, 20,000 years? You know, yeah. but it's not universal yet. But that's mostly because not everybody's met somebody from everywhere yet. Hmm. All right. Well, well, good job. Um, why don't you say bye to everybody? Bye. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for watching. <laughs>